Good morning. I'd like to invite you all to stand and join in worship with us. My name is Megan. Hope you all are enjoying this crisp fall weather. I love it. I'm so excited for fall. Um, all the cozy things. Um, but anyways, as we jump into this song, I'd like to invite you to sing with us, join in worship. You shed your blood I'm gonna live like my shame is gone Won't be shackled to the way I was I'm gonna live like my chains are are washed away to thank you that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus and from this place we can sing that you Jesus you are worthy
to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to see This joy is mine With a thousand hallelujahs We magnify your name You alone Exalt your name on high this morning. You're such a good, good Father, Lord. It is in you that we have peace, and it's in you that we have rest. And we just pray during these turbulent times, Lord God, that your peace and your rest will be with us, Lord. 
We seek your face. We just pray for your presence to come and be with us today and throughout the week. We give you all praise and glory and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You take your seats. Uh, Ushers, just hold on a second. I'm out earlier than I usually am. We'll do a video announcements in a moment. But I have to, I got to show you a gift. Al uh, was out, he was shopping online, which is what he does. And uh, he bought me a present. He brought it in a couple weeks ago. It says this, it says, Pastor warning, anything you say or do could be used as a sermon. Um, So... First of all, my kids have known this warning their whole life. In fact, every time they're getting married, every you know, new daughter-in-law, son-in-law comes in, I sit down and say, just so you know, uh, free game. So be careful what you say, how you live your life. So Al, thanks for thinking of me. But then I got to thinking about something else. Do you guys remember the Sunday when Al and Bobby were late? I mean, like they, the whole service started, we're, we're halfway through it, and they decided that maybe they'll leave their coffee out there, maybe join us. Remember that Sunday? And remember what we said? We said that just punishment would be that they would do a solo for us sometime. I don't remember that solo ever happening. Do you remember that? So, Trevor? We're going to do one, Scott. I don't want to hear, it's ready. No, I, don't, no, I got it all queued up. No, I don't want to hear that. I, within weeks... Al and Bobby are going to come out here and they're going to do a number for us. You, are you in? Hi, church. My name is Adele. I am Pastor Scott's assistant and lead a role solely focused on ensuring people find belonging and community within the life of our church. If this is something you're looking for, please fill out our online connect card found on our Church Center's homepage. Today, I have a few announcements to share with you. Student Ministries is hosting a code drive for the month of October. Please help families in need this holiday season by donating new or gently used coats for both kids and adults. Drop-off locations are held on Sunday mornings in the lobbies at both Essex and North Avenue. The Financial Peace University class is starting today during the 10 a.m. service downstairs in room 204 at Essex Alliance. If you are interested in joining, you still have one week to register and learn how to have a life without financial stress. If you are grieving the loss of a spouse, know that you are not alone. We invite you to our Grief Share seminar on October 14th from 1.30 to 4 p.m. This seminar is designed to provide a safe place to share your thoughts, feelings, and hear from others who have been there as well. We will explore practical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of this loss and look for a path forward. Our night of worship is happening on Wednesday, October 18th, 7 p.m. here at Essex Alliance. Come get away from the noise of the world and join us to experience the joy of worshiping together. We are having an all-day sew-a-thon on Saturday, October 21st here at Essex Alliance. We will be sewing functional items for Bungalow Hospital in Gabon, Central Africa. If you love to sew, please come join us. Whether you are new to our church or have been attending for a while, we invite you to join our Discover EAC class on Sunday, October 22nd from 3 to 7 p.m. This class is led by Pastor Scott Slocum and explains in depth the history, mission, and vision of our church. This class includes a Q&A session and dinner is provided. Our annual trunk retreat is taking place on October 31st from 4 to 6 p.m. at our North Ave campus. We need a lot of candy donations and are looking for volunteers to decorate their vehicle trunks, dress up, and join us in handing out candy. We are very excited about our baptism and child dedication services this fall, Sunday, November 5th. If you are interested in being baptized, sign up on Church Center for a one-on-one. This one-on-one is with one of our church elders and is created for you to express your desire to be baptized and share your story. You can also find more information about child dedications and baptism classes for kids and teens all on Church Center. In just a moment, we will be taking our offering. Thank you for giving so faithfully, whether that be texting to give, online giving, or automatic giving. Your giving makes all these things and more possible. 
Everything I just mentioned can be found on Church Center, specifically under our Sunday morning announcements, where you can easily sign up and gather more information on everything announced. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we are so glad you've chosen to be with us today. All right, ushers, now you can come. We'll share in our offering. Thank you, as you hear me say every week, thank you for giving and making ministry happen uh, and to join in together. Uh, so uh, fall has finally come, huh? I mean, after 83 degrees this week, fall finally came. The most wonderful time of the year. Um, I hear that commercial, it's an allergy commercial, and I got to tell you, it makes me a little annoyed. They're playing Christmas music, but now I'm sucked into it, so now I got it in my head. But this is a wonderful time. You know, don't you love it when you have to wear a sweater? I mean, I love summer, but don't you love it when you have to pull the sweater? These people in Florida, you know, that think they know seasons, they got nothing. I mean, they, we know what it's like to turn the heat around for the first time and have the whole house smell like burning dirt. Um, <laughs> huh? I mean, that's, that's, our, that's us. We got that. It hasn't come on yet, but it's coming. Uh, so many things happening. It really is, in, in the church world for me, one of the exciting times of the year. So many things taking place. You've heard about them already. Adele talking my line. But, I mean, we've got, we're collecting candy uh, taking place for a trunk or treat. We've got the coat drive that's happening. Uh, clean coats, bring them in. Um, Christmas, Operation Christmas Child, the boxes. We're collecting for uh, uh, gift cards that we give out at Christmas. Uh, it's a time for the church to step up in so many ways and demonstrate to the people around us. We care about them. So jump in and participate. You know, I like about the fact that some, not all of us have means. So some of you can go out and buy candy. Some of you don't have that means. But coats, I mean, we've got coats in our closets that we can pull out, wash them up, turn them in. And some, some kids, some adult in, in, in Burlington area is going to have a warm coat. So this, all the things that are there, join in and, and by all means participate. I want to highlight one key thing for you. Um, our, the weekend coming up, the very last weekend in October, October 28 and 29, I want to remind you of that. We have a special guest coming on that day. His name is Dr. Michael Ferris. Uh, and you might recall, he did a presentation about five or six years ago called A Journey to the Potter's House. Um, he, uh, he does pottery. Uh, he, we will have the stage set up for him. It'll be all him. There'll be no worship that day. It'll be a 60 minute time. And he does a presentation with uh, pottery I mean, from everything start to finish, an incredible presentation about the gospel. Uh, and how we get this incredible picture of God and us in this relationship as he will do pottery on stage, uh, putting, forming together some gorgeous, gorgeous pieces and talking the whole way. He's not only, he's not only got his doctorate, uh, he is a pastor, he's a minister, he is a, a licensed counselor. I mean, he understands how to communicate the truth. Some of you recall him being here and have asked for us to bring him back. So we're doing that. But please note, we've added in a Saturday night service. He will be here on Saturday. Saturday for a Saturday evening service on the 28th, one service then, then our times on Sunday morning. And we did that because we've heard from you. Numbers of you have said, you know, when we have Easter on a Saturday night, Christmas Eve, when there's so many choices, it's so, it's so easier, so much easier to invite someone because there's some flexibility. Uh, please invite friends to come on that night. An incredible presentation. And, uh, I mean, Powerful presentation, uh, no pressure on anyone, but this beautiful picture, and he'll take that whole time. There's pottery that you can purchase as part of uh, when, it, when he's all done out in the lobby. Love having him here. That's the first thing. We're having him come back on December, the first Sunday in December. We're having him come back because he actually has a part two where he doesn't use the pottery, but he'll speak that day, and he'll talk about how God heals hearts. He'll talk about just the fact of the hurts that we've gone through and, and the way that God speaks into our lives and changes our lives and, and, uh, and brings healing. Uh, you're going to want to invite folks for both of those. So we, you'll be hearing more and more every week as we get closer to that, but make sure 28, 29, Saturday night and Sunday, we have Michael Ferris here. It'll be a great, a great weekend. This morning, we're going to continue in our series, I've Lost My Faith. If, uh, if you're here because a friend invited you, maybe a friend or a coworker, family member said, hey, you got to come to church and hear the series you're doing on lo having lost faith. Maybe you're one of those folks that have lost your faith. You've kind of communicated that. And so here you are. And if you are here because of that, I say, welcome. I'm so glad you've come and you're safe. Please know we're not going to pick on you, have you stand up, anything crazy like that. And I want you to know as well that my hope is to engage you in thought process. If you're here and you have lost your faith, if you're here, 
and you have gone through some kind of difficult church background in your past, we're going to talk about some of that, it takes incredible courage to walk in here and be here today, not knowing what to expect or what could happen next. I do my best to make sure that you're safe and engage with me as we walk through this. If you're a regular church person and you're saying, you know, I haven't lost my faith. Um, my faith is strong, but you know those moments come. I think what you're going to hear today will be an encouragement to you and, and, and strengthen your faith. I would also suggest to you that what you might hear today uh, might be something that you can use when you're speaking with other folks. I'm going to give you some thoughts and some things today that you can use as your dialogue with folks because so many times as I have spoken to people about faith faith issues, I hear that statement. I used to believe, but I don't anymore. Given up on church, those kind of statements. I'm thinking today might help you along the way as we walk through this. So we're talking about those folks and the thought process, I've lost my faith, I used to believe, I've given up on religion. And we're not talking about the people that are saying that with anger, like they're looking, picking a fight. We're not, they're not angry at the church, not angry at, at God. But when they say it, there's some pain in it. You know, when they say they've lost their faith, they're not saying it with a, with a clenched fist. They're saying it kind of a brokenness. That it, it, there's a, it's a very lonely feeling, I have to tell you. We talked about this last week a little bit. There's an incredible loneliness when you take God out of the picture. And so I want to speak to those folks that would feel some of that loneliness along the way. Now, as we get started, I think we need to be honest and transparent about a couple of things. I want to make some statements, talk about a few things that for some of you, you'll love. Some of you might hate. We'll see how it goes here as we walk through this. But let's be honest. Sometimes this religious stuff, the church stuff and religion stuff, let's be honest, sometimes it gets pretty weird. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff that pops up in the, in the, the things that we do or required to do, the things that we have to practice. Um, Diane and I have had the privilege of doing some traveling through the years around the world in different countries. And, and of course, none of us want to be disrespectful. I don't want to be disrespectful at all. But as I've traveled around and see different religious and, and, and faith systems, admittedly, at times you walk away and go, man, there's some weird stuff out there. So there's some weird stuff that people do that, yeah, you have to, you have to sit a certain way or sit a certain time or require to kneel. The things you have to wear or you can't wear, how you have to cut your hair or braid your hair, um, you know, those kind of things, certain pieces of clothing you have to have, certain jewelry you have to have, t- tattoos you may have to have. I mean, all that stuff, you got to cover your face or cover your head. There's all these things that can get kind of weird along the way. Now, of course, none of us think that what we do is weird because it's ours, right? That's how it goes. What we do is not weird because what we do is right. You see, the other stuff, that's weird. Those people don't know what they're missing, but our weirdness is ours, and so then it's okay. That's the way it works. But truthfully, what we do or how we do church to you might seem normal, but to a person perhaps walking in for the first time, it can seem really odd. It can seem really, really weird, and you'll get that. Years ago, I, a, guy, a guy came up to me after a church service, pretty animated, right here in front, and came this, he, so I came to a worship service. I said, okay, but you can tell there's an edge to it. Wherever we were going, wasn't going to be good. I came to a worship service. Instead, what I got is karaoke on the big screen and a lecture by a used car salesman. <laughs> now, first of all, if you're here today and you're a used car salesman, I stand with you. <laughs> That was the statement. Their statement was, I'm a used car salesman. They came for worship. They got karaoke on the screen and a lecture from a used car salesman. Apparently, it, wasn't good, it was not a good worship experience for him, I'm guessing. Years ago, I went and heard a guy speak. I can't remember, the, I can't remember his name for the life of me, but he, was, uh, he became a, kind of a Christian speaker of sorts and different things, and he was recounting the story when he first walked into a church. He was not a believer, didn't go to church. Uh, he, he was invited to go, so he went with a friend. And what I'm going to say next, some of you who grew up in the church will remember some of this, though it's not our tradition now, but he said, I walked into the church, and he said it was a communion Sunday. He said, I had no idea what communion was, but some of you recall back in the day, if you grew up in a church, there would be a communion table up front. It had all, had all the communion trays that would be stacked high, and then it would be covered with what looked like a burial cloth. And he walked in and he said, so I'm walking in, there's a body up front. <laughs> His thought process is, this is weird, there's a body up front, and they act like it doesn't exist. And he said, I'm sitting next to the guy who invited me, and they introduce a a song we're going to sing, and he leans over, and he goes, oh, I love this song. And he said, here's the first words to the song. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. He goes, where are these people from? (laughs) 
why am I here? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their crimson stains. He goes, I'm not getting in any flood of blood was his thought process. Now we would say, oh, I know the beauty of the, the, the poetry of the words, but for the out, outsider walking in, they look at this and they go, this is some weird stuff. Now, of course, we don't think it's weird because it's right according to us. But that's what happens. And, and the point is this, church, religion can get kind of weird along the way. In some cases, religion can become very mystical. Christians can become very mystical in their thought process. The chanting, the silence, the clearing of their mind, they're, they're seeing God in all these odd places or odd things. Then on top of that, you have, in the middle of the faith stuff, you got people who, with a mysticism, become real superstitious about different things in different ways. Um, I've had some folks I've talked to through the years that they'll walk into a church building like this. I had one gentleman I talked to, had a good conversation. He'd walk in the back. Every time he walked in, he had to stop and genuflect. He had to kneel, and he'd kneel there. He'd kneel halfway and kneel when he got to his seat. And I had to stop and say, you don't have to do that here. You know, there's nothing sacred up here that you have to kneel. If I'm here, you can kneel, but other than that, you don't kneel in front of me. You know, but, but the thought processes are something that we have to do along the way. That's kind of some of those uh, pictures. Then you have the, the, I read some of the news and you get someone who says, I, I found the picture, I found the face of Mary on a potato chip. I have no idea what to do with that. I have no idea what to do with that. Or then someone says, I see the face of Jesus that came through the paint on the wall or something like that. And you go, well, what do you do with that? Well, usually what happens in our culture, we take something that might have some mystical feel to it. We'll take the potato chip or whatever it might be, put it in a box, put a, build a shrine and people will come and worship it because it could be something. Uh, that's the reality of the world we live today. Um, we have a trip coming to Israel in a couple of months. Be, be, please be in prayer for Israel if you're watching in the news there. Be in prayer for everyone that's involved. The loss of life is staggering. And someone's saying, are you still going? We are. It's months away and we'll, we'll keep on top of that. But my point is this. If you go with me to Israel, everywhere you go, if someone thinks something happened on this site, immediately they build a church. I mean, you'll be in a place where someone thinks that something happened. There'll be four churches right in a row where everyone says this particular event happened at this spot or this spot or this spot or this spot. And so they build a, build a church, build a shrine to whatever could have happened there. One of the reasons when I, when I go, I tell our folks, I love the Galilee region because you know what? You can't build a shrine on top of the Sea of Galilee. And you can look at that, see that, that big lake and say, Jesus walked on that water right there. And no one can claim a spot. But that's what we do. We find our things and we, we make shrines and we worship them. Another thing that can happen in religion is that we can become very legalistic and very judgmental, can't we? You see, once I've decided what's right, and now that I know it's right, well, then you have to live accordingly or you're wrong. That's the way it goes. And so churches can become, Christians can become very legalistic. And now, the list of all the things that you have to do in order to fit in, the check-off list of the boxes we have to check off to make sure we get it right, all that stuff goes on. But let me tell you another thing that religion can become, and that is you, got, you move out of the judgmentalism and the legalism, and the church, you know, religious stuff also creates a lot of hypocrites. Wouldn't you agree that a lot of hypocrites kind of get created along the way? I mean, religion can become very hypocritical. Well, why is that? Well, I'll give you the answer why. Because nobody, and I mean nobody, no one, does as well as they pretend to be doing, including me. You see, all of us want to pretend that we're doing really well in whatever it is, whether it's our business, our business success, with our spiritual life. None of us are doing as well as we pretend to be doing. But here's the problem. It's one thing for me to blow it and to not get it right. But then I pretend to get it right, and on top of that, I point out to you when you're getting it wrong. Hypocritical. And it's pretty easy for that to happen. Let me give you one more thing about religion that is kind of strange. It's almost as if it's the, the harder and the more uh, odd something is that you're required to do, the more religious it feels. It's like some of the cults, they say in order to be close to God, you have to cut your hair or shave your head or give up certain things. You have to dress a certain way. If you're a true believer, you'll do this, 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 and then people do it. It seems sometimes that the odder the thing is, or the 
more difficult the requirement, the more religious it must be. So let's be honest here real quick at the starting place. Religion can promote and create some pretty weird stuff along the way. But now let me explain real quickly. So now stick with me. We're going to get into the meat of here. Let me explain real quickly why the oddity and the weirdness and some of the odd stuff that happens in religion and in churches, why it's understandable. I didn't say why it's acceptable. I did say why it's understandable. You see, these type of oddities, I understand them because of what religion is trying to do. And what religion tries to do is an odd thing already. So here we go, thought process. You see, religion has its, its mission to do this. Religion tries to span the gap, bridge the gap between God and us. God, us. And what religion is trying to do continually is trying to figure out how to get us together. Religion tries to span the gap between the sacred and between the secular, between the holy and between the unholy. Religion tries to span the gap between that which we know, which is us, this is our world, and that which is unknown, the spiritual world, right? So what happens is we say, okay, there is a God, but then how do we connect with that God? It's one thing to acknowledge there's a God out there, but then how do we connect with that God? How do we connect with something that we can't see, with something or someone that we can't touch, but we hope that he exists? That's what religion tries to do. It tries to figure out how to span that gap. So it's understandable that in this oddity of what it's trying to do, it's, it, it, makes, it's, it's understands that, it, understandable to me anyway, that we do odd stuff as we're trying to figure out how to connect with something which is so other dimensional. I mean, God is so other dimensional than where we live. So I I get it. I understand it. I'm not saying that it's good. I just understand why we'll do some crazy stuff in trying to make this connection. Now, let's be really honest here. Chances are really, really good that you, if you have ever lost your faith or have that feeling, It's been centered around that faith loss thing, but maybe if you're honest, the faith loss thing has been more based upon judgmental people, legalism, and a bunch of religious stuff. Maybe it hasn't really been about God. So this morning, I want to look at a passage that talks about church, talks about faith stuff before before the church started, before all the religious people got involved and clouded, if you will, before the weird stuff. You see, when Christianity first began, before there were churches and steeples, before there were Bible study groups or children's ministries or student ministries, before there were crosses and worship teams, there wasn't any of this goofy religious stuff. I mean, there was uh, no hypocrisy, nobody being judgmental, no legalism, no mystical hand of God stuff. When it all first began, there was just a story, powerful story. A life-changing story. And the story was so liberating. Now, at its core, there is a question. And its core is this question for, which, for each of us today. And that question is this. What would you hope to find? If there is a God, now we know that there is, but I'll put it as a question mark. If there is a God who knows your name and who wants to have a relationship with you, then for you, what would that look like? What would you hope to find in that relationship? If there really is a God who knows you and cares about you, knows your name, cares about you, and wants you to know him, then what would you hope to find in that relationship? What would you hope that that would look like? See, I am so convinced that all the religious stuff gets in the way of the real faith stuff. This stuff causes so many of us to give up on religion and give up our faith, but I'm not sure God's the issue. I think oftentimes it's all the religious stuff. That's what we're going to talk about. So let's look at a story from the book of Acts. Don't forget the book of Acts, the collection of events and accounts of things that happen actually as they happen or shortly thereafter. And so Acts actually records the happening of events that happened right after Jesus left this earth and went into heaven. It included in these events some things that were happening in the local church as the church began. So this morning, we're going to look at Acts chapter 17. If you want to use a Bible, you can do that. We'll put the verses on the screen like always. We're going to look at Acts chapter 17, but some quick background. Last week, we looked at the Apostle Paul. He was, uh, he was arrested, and he's speaking before King Agrippa. That was later in the story. This is much earlier in the story. Uh, in Acts 17, we get this picture. So Paul was a very religious Jewish guy, becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. 
Paul goes on mission to take the story of Jesus to the Greeks and the Romans, to the Greek and Roman Empire. That's his mission. Why the Greek and Roman Empire? Because that's who was in control of the world. And so his vision is to take this story beyond Jerusalem, take the story beyond that inner circle of the, of the, the uh, Judaistic people. And if you're going to do that, you're going to go into the Greek and Roman territory. So that's his mission. That's his plan. He takes his message from the, of Jesus places that, that didn't believe in God Almighty. You don't forget that Jerusalem was the epicenter of Judaism. So that was the epicenter of a belief in a God, the God Almighty. But now he's going to go places where they don't have that belief system of God Almighty, if you will. He's going to the Greeks and the Romans. Now, please know that we're very religious people, all sorts of gods, but not like in the center of Judaism. They had more gods they know what to do with. So he's about to step into that culture. Now imagine the hard sell that he would have to make. Just imagine the difficult story that he has to give. You see, here is his message to the Greek and the Romans um, who had no appreciation, no connection to Judaism. So they had no connection to all of the Old Testament books, no connection to this concept of an almighty God. And here comes Paul and here's his story. So the story goes like this. So I want to tell you a story. A guy named Jesus, he's a Jewish kid. Uh, he's born to a carpenter. In fact, he becomes a carpenter. He does that for a number of years, and then he becomes a preacher and teacher. But in fact, he really is the son of God, but nobody knows it. He's the son of God, but God didn't announce it. God didn't tell anybody. Uh, he's just a carpenter, but he's actually a son of God. And I'm going to ask you to abandon everything that you believe and believe my story. And so the carpenter becomes preacher, teacher, and uh, he has a following because, oh, don't forget, he is the son of God. And you might interrupt him and say, okay, so where is Jesus now? Oh, he's, he died. So he's dead. Well, not exactly. Now, now it's going to get real mucky here. Not exactly. So you go, well, how, do you, how is he not exactly dead? Well, he was dead, but he's now alive. Well, how does that work? Well, he died, and he was dead for three days. And they know he was dead, but he rose from the dead. I got to tell you, that's a pretty hard sell story. That's a hard sell story today. That would be a pretty hard sell story. And in fact, don't forget, while he's telling them this, he's saying, and so when I get done with my story, I want you to abandon everything you've always known, and I want you to follow me and my story. Follow Jesus in the story, but I want you to be one of my followers too. We're going to do this together. Man, that's a hard sell. See, no one is going to believe this, but Paul decides he's going to take this message anyway to these people. Now, in our story today, we find Paul, he's in the city of Athens. I don't have time to read all the background, so I got to tell tell it to you real quick before you start reading some passages together. He's in the the city of Athens. He's waiting for a couple of friends to show up. Once they show up, then they're going to begin one of their missionary journeys where they're going to go out and plant churches around around the world. Now, while he's in Athens, he's walking around enjoying the streets like you would if you were in New York City or some other big city. He's walking around taking it all in, and he notices that there are very religious people, incredibly religious. They've got, they've got shrines and temples and, and idols everywhere in the city, all sorts of worship spots, if you will. So he, it's connecting to him that there's a very religious people, but it's bothering him a little bit. So he decides to have a conversation with these very religious people. Here's where we pick up in verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. So while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, waiting for his friends, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So, okay, everywhere he looks, there's idols, all of these different gods. There's all sorts of temples, there'd be all sorts of shrines, all sorts of worship spots. Now, what that means is this, catch this, an important statement. Though they were very religious, they were very uncertain. You see, they had, they had places to worship everywhere. They had all sorts of gods to worship. They were incredibly religious people, but they weren't certain. They didn't exactly know which to follow, which one was right. They wanted to believe something, but they didn't know what to believe. I would suggest to you, friends, that's the same as us. Same as us today. We've got people that want to believe something. Yeah, I think there's a God, but I'm not exactly sure what to believe about this God. Continue on, verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both the Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Simple statement, he was willing to engage you wherever you lived. You know, he wasn't just speaking to religious people in response, but in the marketplace, he would speak and talk to people who would ever engage with him. Verse 18. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what's this babbler trying to say? 
Others remarked he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, the Epicureans believed in a, in a fun life. Their basic motto is live to the fullest. That was their attitude. They believed that life was about pleasure. Don't get hung up in details. Don't get hung up in all the requirements of life, whatever. Just be happy because when you die, it's over. So live the moment. That was one philosophical view of the day. The Stoics had a different view. The Stoics were the intellectuals. They were the heady people. They wanted to debate things and think deep thoughts. You know, them, them and the scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz. They just liked sitting around thinking deep, deep thoughts because they could. And if you had a question or a theological issue, they would debate it to, to its death and talk it over and over and over again and go on and on and on. That were the Stoics. Now, apparently these guys were so smart and apparently wealthy that they never had to go to work. All they did is sit and debate and talk. So they're deciding these life issues. They're deciding about how to connect between this world and God. And Paul begins to have this dialogue. Now, they hear the story and they say to him, he's a babbler. Like, what's this babbler trying to say? Now, why would they call him a babbler? This is pretty important. You just might miss it, but here's why. Because Paul's message is so weird to them. It's so odd there was, there was no common ground between what they believed and practiced and what Paul was telling them. You see, if you have a conversation, somebody who says, I, I believe in God, but from that point, this God might vary in different directions, but they didn't believe in a God. They had these multiple gods, and Paul's saying something so radically different. They had no ability to connect the dots. To them, it sounded like Paul was maybe trying to add another God into the mix, but yet the point would be here that they have absolutely have nothing in common. He's just babbling. Because they couldn't relate to anything that he was trying to say. Paul, but, but, but the problem is Paul wasn't simply trying to add another God to the mix. What he's actually saying is if we start from zero, there is a God. There's only one God, not many. There's one God, the almighty God, who sends his son into our world to connect with us. His name is Jesus. Jesus comes and dies. And to prove that he really is a son of God, he rises from the dead. So that's the storyline. Paul moves from philosophical and theological here to a practical here and now, which you might miss. You see, they're talking about this, this, the gods that they've been worshiping for generations and for you know, hundreds and thousands of years, trying to connect this world. But Paul's switching this, and he's not talking about some ancient legend. He's saying that there's a guy that came. His name is Jesus. Some may have known that name. But his point would be, but this is current, this is new, this is new news. And that God sends his son, his name is Jesus. He was here, he died and rose from the dead. And in fact, you could add this into the mix. Paul could also say, and if you don't believe me, go to Jerusalem with me and you can actually interview people who actually saw all these events take place. That's how fresh it is. So there's a new story here. They're talking about religious thoughts out there somewhere. And Paul's talking about God being right here, right now, that they could actually know. Verse uh, 19, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, uh, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? What's the Areopagus? This is a gathering, a council, if you will, a court, where great religious leaders, philosophical minds would come together, and they would listen to people make presentations. So somebody comes and says, hey, I have a new idea about God. They would say, okay, make your case, and we'll decide whether it's authentic or not, real, realistic enough to, to tell people. So they call him into that, and they say, okay, tell us your story. So he begins in verse 20. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. All of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. I don't know how these guys got their money, but what a great gig. I'm going to pay me all day to sit and talk about nothing. I like it. I like it a lot. That's, what it, that's the setup. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, and he said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Pause right there. He immediately gets their attention. Do you know why? Because he just paid them a high compliment. He doesn't start the debate with saying, what is wrong with you stupid people? He starts by saying, I can see that you are incredibly religious. He begins with a compliment. Everywhere I look, he says, everywhere I look, I see statues and shrines, uh, worship spots. You're incredibly religious people. Verse 23. 
For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Let's pause there for a little bit and talk about this. So he's walking around. He finds an altar, a shrine, a place to worship an unknown God. Now, you need to understand this because what they were doing and what they were thinking is the same things that people in our world today think as well. See, their thinking is this. Now, follow me. How do you get rain for your crops in a, in a Middle Eastern desert type area? How do you protect your children from sickness and disease that was, we, what would come through a country and, and kill off millions of people? Uh, how do you get successful? How do you keep your house from burning down? How do you keep the gods engaged in the, it, to your benefit? Well, you do that by putting up a shrine and by worshiping those gods. You do that by appeasing the gods. But now here's the thought process. What if we miss one? You know, what if I'm doing all the right things for the right gods, but all of a sudden uh, there's a God out there that somehow we've missed? How do I cover that basis? So, good thinking. Let's put up a shrine to the unknown God. We'll put up a shrine in case we've missed someone along the way. You see, if there really is a standout God and he happens to show up, we can at least say, look, we weren't even sure who you were, but we we, we were thinking of you and we got your shrine. That should mean something to you. Now, remember, they're very, very religious, but they're very uncertain. Now, we can kind of laugh at that and think, well, that's crazy. But I have to be honest with you. We see the same thing in our culture today. But here's how it sounds for us today. A person can not go to church. A person can care nothing about spiritual things, not care anything about God, even deny there's a God or whatever, nothing at all. Live their lives any way that they please. But then Christmas Eve comes or Easter and they say, you know, I should probably go to church Christmas Eve. Maybe I'll go to one of the Easter services. Why is that? Ah, can't hurt. Better to be safe than sorry. I mean, might as well go. It doesn't really hurt me to go, but that way I kind of, I keep my my bases covered. And while they're there, they drop, you know, they walk by the offering box. And while they're there, they go, oh, I'll drop a little tip in to God. Nothing wrong with tipping God. Same thought process we have oftentimes. We go someplace, it gets good service, we tip. Or if we want to get good service, we tip. Went to a resort years ago that Diane and I, and I went, I, I, I like my eggs a certain way. And the guy had a tip jar there, and usually you give your tip at the end. And he made the eggs, and he made them perfect. I'm going to be there for five days. And so instead of waiting to the end, I, I looked at him and said, these eggs are fantastic. This sounds dumb, but I like my eggs. And they got to be done right. Don't be doing them too hard. Don't be doing them too soft. Like, perfect. And they're perfect. And so instead of giving them like two bucks, I take a 20 and say, I'm going to be here a week. Thank you for today, those eggs. I was so embarrassed like the next day. I come for breakfast. There's a line of like 10 people. And he sees me. Hey, uh, yo, mister, mister, right up here. I walk up. He goes, ah, I'm going to fix your eggs special for you. And everyone's going, what's wrong with our eggs? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe I tipped him. You see, we think like that. So tipping God can't be wrong. In one of my uh, former churches, I had a fella that um, didn't, uh, didn't attend very often, didn't, well, didn't attend at all, didn't even like church, didn't care about God at all. But the thought process was the just in case, if you will. And uh, what he would do was one of our best givers was this guy who didn't even believe in God. And you say, well, why would he do that? just in case. I mean, even if I don't really believe in him, but God, look what I've done. Look at all the stuff the church can do because I've given to you pretty faithful, faithfully. So that happens a lot in our thought process. We have this thought that says, well, I'll, you know, I'll cover my bases just in case. Look, God, I don't even believe in you, but, but you know, once a year, I just in case, look what I did. It's got to be worth something. That's the same exact way the Athenians were thinking about this shrine to an unknown God. Lots of ideas, lots of hopes, but no certainty. So Paul sees this and he sees this the moment. He realizes that this shrine is there openly admitting that they don't know everything, right? Now just catch this. This shrine to an unknown God are the people there saying, you know what? We, we don't know everything. 
We don't have all the answers. We have questions we don't have answers for. There's a possibility that we've missed something out there. There's this gap between us and connecting with God, and maybe this unknown God is one of the key players in closing the gap. So Paul steps in. He steps in by saying these words, so you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. Now just pause right there for a moment, because it doesn't sound real good in English. But unfortunately, that's the way a lot of Christians think today. Well, they're all ignorant, not like us. But that's not what the word means. What the word means that Paul used in that moment was this. He wasn't saying, so you're ignorant. He was saying this, so you're uncertain. It means uncertain. Paul says, so you're uncertain of the very things you worship. Please know it was not a put down. It was not our our approach which would be, well, we're right, you're wrong. His approach was, so let me get this right. So you're uncertain of the very things that you're, you're worshiping. So Paul said, well, let me help you. And he goes into a great sermon, uh, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. So what's interesting, the first lesson he wants to give them is this. And this would be important to a people who had all sorts of gods. He says this. Your vision of God's too small. His first picture he gives to them is this. God's bigger than your religious thought process. God is bigger than your boxes. God's bigger than all these shrines that you've built. There is a God, and he's bigger than any of those things. You see, the real God, the God Almighty, doesn't fit into your religious box. Then he keeps going, verse 25. And he has not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and gives them everything else. Now, this was important because if you walked around all these shrines and all these worship spots, you would see that the people would regularly bring food for their God. They'd bring all sorts of food and lay them there. They would bring money and lay it there. They'd bring clothes and expensive jewelry and and perfumes and things. They'd bring them there for their God. And of course, they would mysteriously disappear because the God would come and take them. Well, no, probably because the temple priests would come and gather them. But they did all these things because they were meeting the needs of their God. Here's the point. You see, they served their gods like their gods needed their help. They were serving their gods like somehow the gods were dependent on them to feed them. Or they served their gods in hopes of keeping their gods happy because you don't want an angry God, so you have to appease the gods. But look at the difference, Paul says. He goes, God is bigger than your your religious box. And you got it all wrong. You keep bringing things to your God. You got to look at what God brought to you. He goes, you're here in the relationship here. You're the givers. In this relationship, God's the giver. You don't have to keep giving to God as if he needs you to give something to him. You didn't know it. But this unknown God that you have this little shrine to, he he exists and he's real. But you're not going to worship this unknown God like you're worshiping the rest of the gods because he's got it turned completely backwards. Verse 26, from one man he made all of the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Now in that one statement, he was going to upset all of the Roman and Greek culture on, on gods because he basically says there is a God and there's only one of them. You know, in a place that would have thousands of them, there's only one of them. You see, they had all sorts of gods. They had a God for every town, for every event, for every season, all sorts of God. Paul says there's only one God, and he's created all of humanity, and he set the boundaries of life. Paul's getting ready to give them the one thing that they actually long for in, this, in their whole quest. Verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. Paul says, you know, look, seek him, renounce, reach out for him, and your whole religious life, you're reaching out, hoping to find him. That's what religion does. Religion says this, there's God and there's us, and somehow we'll reach out to him and hope that we can connect that gap. That's all the stuff that we do. That's all the religious stuff that we do to try try to somehow reach out to God. But Paul says, but I got good news for you. You know, while you're reaching out to this almighty God, he's the only God who actually reaches back to you. You see, all the other gods, you're still waiting for those other gods to do something, but not this God. This God reaches back to you while you reach out to him. And And the next thing, he actually quotes some of their philosophers of the day. In verse 28, 
For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. I think it's interesting that at this point, he actually speaks to them using their own philosophers. Um, he doesn't quote scripture, doesn't quote the Old Testament. He just says, hey, let's talk about the very people that you quote today. And he speaks to them in, in using their words. Now, at this point, they would still be very interested. Please know. They would still be very interested because they were open-minded people. So here's how they might think. They go, okay, okay, wait, wait. So you're saying there's one God. You know, we always had room for that. We thought he was Zeus. But you're saying maybe it's not Zeus. So at this point, they wouldn't shut him down yet. It'd be like, okay, you got us. You know, it's pretty good. You're pretty sharp. And you're kind of fitting right into what we think. So keep going. So he does. Keeps going in verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So he starts by saying, you know, we, we, everything that we are and who we are, we, we are because of his existence. The, this almighty creates us. And then he says, because we're God's offspring, uh, this divine being that you keep trying to put into gold or silver or stone, you can't put him into gold, silver, or stone. His statement is this, we're all his offspring, so forget all this idle stuff you keep doing. You know, he, what he's subtly saying is this, you keep humanly trying to create God and create these worship centers. You keep trying to create this way to connect with God. And he goes, I gotta tell you, it doesn't work. And then he said something in verse 30, which is kind of profound. He says this, in the past, God has overlooked such ignorance. Well, ignorant of what? You know, he said, basically, God, you've been ignorant for a long time. You haven't known what you're doing here. And God's overlooked it. Well, ignorant of what? Ignorant of who God is. You've been trying to figure out who God is. And all this time, God's overlooked it. You know, you, how can we know him? What does he look like? God overlooks your ignorance. He's overlooked it, but not now. So you got to catch this here. What he's talking about now is a change. All for generations, they've looked, they believed in the gods and trying to figure out who God is. And he goes, but God overlooked your ignorance about knowing who God is, but something has changed. You haven't understood it, I got it. You couldn't see him, you couldn't touch him, understand that. But now something has changed. Now he commands all people, here's the next statement, it says, he commands all people to repent. Pause right there. When we hear the word repent today, it's not a good word for us. When we heard the word repent today, we think, turn from your, your wicked ways, stop your evil lifestyle, blah, blah, you know, that's, that's repent. But that's not what it means in the word that he used. What he said to them this, he said, but now is the time where God calls you to change the way that you think. Repent. He says, now it's time for you to start thinking differently about God. God overlooked your not knowing. God overlooked your ignorance along the way, but not now. That word now is really key because what he's saying to them, you've got all these things that have been here for generations, but you know something happened not too long ago when Jesus went to the cross and when Jesus came back from the dead. That was a game changer. So now he's talking about the now. They're trying to figure out if they can know God. He's saying, actually, you can know God and you can know him right now in this moment. Verse uh, 31. For he has set, still talking about God, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, meaning Jesus, and he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, now we get into the nitty gritty. Paul says this, listen guys, this is a game changing moment for you, so listen carefully. Everything that you believe, everything that you practice is based upon an unproven past a creation of the gods, if you will, a bunch of thoughts and beliefs. But listen, I'm here to tell you there is a God. There is a God. And he's near to you. One who came to give, not to take from you. He is one who knows your name and he wants you to know him personally. I know, I know this would be hard for you to believe. He knew this would be hard for you to believe, that God would actually have a son that would be in this world and living among us. So what he did is his son died and he brought his son back to life to prove that he really is the son of God. And if you don't believe me, come to Jerusalem and we'll interview people and you can talk to them firsthand. 
Verse 32. And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council and some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. So he lost some at that point. As soon as he talks about resurrection from the dead, he lost some. We lose people today on that one. Who's ever, who's ever had someone come back from the dead? But make sure you get this, but you didn't lose everyone in that moment. So let's kind of wrap up. Here's today's point. Chances are good that you have had a bad or odd or strained or some kind of cultic experience of some kind in, in your religious background, religious context. I wouldn't ask for a show of hands, but here's the point. Um, if I were a betting man, I'd bet money that just about every single person here would say, I have experienced some strange, odd, weird stuff in church or the Christian context. Some church, some Christian, some Christian leader, some people who have been way off base on their beliefs, crazy stuff goes on in the church, and you have been affected by it and perhaps even hurt by it. But the truth is this, when you pull away all of the religious stuff, when you pull away all the stuff that happens in churches and people cry and complain about, the buildings take the crosses and the steeples, I want more hymns or I don't like the music or it's too loud or whatever it might be, you have to dress a certain way, you have to look a certain way, you have to look holy if you're going to be in church, take away the stuff that have been in churches sometimes like this, well shame on you for having marital problems. We've got people who've got deep relational problems that don't share them because their feeling is they get judged because of it. Shame on you for having an addiction in your life. Shame on you for having gone through a divorce. Shame on you for having gone through an abortion. Shame on you for having all these problems and doubts. If you can strip away all of the religious garbage that has come with the package, strip them all away and go back to the very beginning of the gospel story as it first happened, what you find is mind-blowing. It is just incredible. Paul says to them, listen, you haven't been wrong about everything. Now, here's where I'm going to get ready to close, so, so tune in with me. Especially if you're a person that sees the world and sees the evil in the world, or sees the thought process, or see the stuff happening in the world, and you're sitting there saying, oh, they're so wrong, and you just want to, you want to pick up the cross and go to a holy war because of the stuff that's happening. Paul never did that. If you're there and you're a believer, you say, oh, we are right. Paul never came across with the arrogance of being right. Paul says to them, listen, you know, You guys are very religious, and you haven't been wrong. You haven't been wrong about everything. I mean, you believe that God exists. Man, that's that's, that's the right view. There is a God. You're doing your best to reach out to him and to somehow connect with him. Man, that's good. That's exactly right. And he goes, and here's the good news for you. Um, God is, in fact, reaching back to you. All this stuff in your life, you're trying to reach out to God. I just want to let you know that God is actually reaching back to you. God doesn't want you to have to live with uncertainty. God wants to be known. God knows you and God wants you to know him and he wants you to know him in a personal way, not in a way of fear or appeasement. And he's done that not through traditions. God is doing that not through philosophies, not through rituals, not through burning candles, not through rote prayers you have to repeat over and over again or all those different things. He comes to you in person through his son, Jesus, who died on a Roman cross, who came back from the dead to prove that he is the real deal and that he is the Lord of life and he brings life to you. You see, the problem with religion is that it always asks the wrong questions. You see, religion asks the question, well, who's right? Better question would be, well, who is Jesus Christ? Just answer that question. Religion asks, well, what's true? And the better question would be, what could it mean? What could it mean to have someone who actually came back from the dead? What could could it mean to have Jesus who rose from the dead? Religion asks the question, well, what does God want from me? And Christianity says, look what God has done for you. 
Look what God gives to you. Religion asks the question, well, what do I have to sacrifice to be accepted by God? And Christianity says, look at the sacrifice God made to make you acceptable. Now, friend, here's the key as we wrap up and close. Jesus Christ is not like Jesus, is not like religion 2.0. Jesus Christ is not like the best software you have on your computer. You're going to get the next one that adds to it. He is not that. Jesus is not the nice add-on that you add on to your already existing belief system and make it even stronger. No, no. Jesus is the answer to all the questions that religion has been asking for generation after generation after generation. Religion has always been saying, how do we span the gap between my little world here, my life, and the God of the, of the unknown, the, the God of eternity? How do I span that gap? Jesus is the answer to all of that. Better said, Jesus is himself the answer to all the religious questions that religious feeling people have been trying to get answers to. Is there a God? Can he be known? Are we known to him? Does he care about me? That's why Paul didn't do what so many Christians do today. Paul didn't go on the attack. The Apostle Paul didn't launch into a holy war. Didn't feel like we got to stop evil in its tracks. He said, no, I got a story to tell you. That'll change your life. He didn't come out and say, you're all wrong. Can't believe you're getting it wrong. You poor, ignorant people. Nope. He starts by saying, I need you to know that you haven't been wrong. In fact, your questions have been exactly right. Your questions, I mean, what you're after have come right from your heart because there's a longing in every one of our hearts to think if there is a God, how do we connect? He said, that's the right thing. He says, all the right questions that you've always been asking, God sent Jesus Christ as the answer to all of them. Friends, don't let religion get in the way of the real message of who God is. If you feel that you've lost your faith, if you find times in your life where you look around and you go, I'm losing my faith or I don't know anymore, I would ask you to take a step back for just a moment because I think if you're honest, you realize in that, may, in that moment, maybe God isn't the issue. Maybe it's all the other trappings that come in and make a lot of noise. Now, there's a key tension that happens with, this, with religion. We're going to talk about that next week and see how Jesus answers that. But I would contend as we close this morning, you stop and think about your faith. If you can just get back to this incredible story, all the other stuff just falls aside. Stand, please. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we conclude today, I, I publicly say I am sorry. I am sorry for the times that I have contributed to the noise, to the religious noise that people feel. I apologize for the place that sometime your church and your people who, who I will honestly say it many, most times mean well, we get it wrong and we actually create damage because we just get away from the simple, simple story of your redeeming love. For the person this morning that has, been, has felt like their faith has just been beat up along the way, might you be working in their life even today for that restoration. Give them the right picture of who you are without the religious trappings. The God of love, the God of grace, the God of peace, the God of forgiveness. Dismiss us today in your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.